Welcome to Grassroots Racing. I'm here today at the famous St Gatian Stables with a very famous trainer, a legend in his own lifetime, Peter Chappelheim. Um, I'd like to thank him for letting us come in today and, and talk to him. Um, and we'll, we'll start, Pete. Um, I'd like to start right from the beginning, as far back as you can remember, from your days, uh, you Before know, like... Fred Rymel. <laughs> <laughs> like, from, obviously, you're from Warwickshire. Yeah, but my uncles were more were the, uh, the people into the horses. My my mother's four four brothers. Uh, my, her eldest brother Peter, he's still alive. He's he's at farms and we had point to pointers. My two cousins there, both ride both rode point to points. And I used to go racing with them. Then my other uncle Wilma, <laughs> he had a yard, trained about ten jumpers in the village I was from, uh, and then his. So my cousin Bob Mann, he was quite a successful jockey. And then I had Frank Mann, he trained a few. They were all sort of farmers, but trained a few. And then, and then my grandfather, on my mother's side, I used to go racing with him to Warwick, Stratford, Worcester, every Saturday, basically. And then we'd, uh, especially if it was Warwick, I'd have to sit on his lap and steer the car home because he might have had a couple of whiskies. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. I mean, the good old days. Um, can I just ask if, was that, where, where was you when you told me a story once about when you was uh, kids and you was in the car with Fanshawe? Oh, yeah, no, James is... Uh, did he come from your area? Yeah, he did, yeah. James, James came from the posh village next door. <laughs> uh, and we used to meet his... Sorry, we didn't used to meet. But his father, my father, my uncle Peter, uh, and John Thorne, who had Spartan Missile, if you remember him. Yeah, I've heard he was of that one. the Grand National. Yeah. And then, obviously, Nicky Henderson, who was dating uh, his daughter, or used to meet my uncle. My other uncle had the pub. Uh, and James and I used to sit outside drinking our Coke and packet of crisps. And he had the biggest, thickest pair of glasses on you ever did see. And then we, used to, we were allowed to play football together on the green. And... Well, he couldn't see the ball, so he's easy, mate. <laughs> Just amazing that um, you come from, from that far away and you've both ended up here very close together. Yeah, no, we do, yeah. I'm still, obviously still very friendly with James, yeah. But as I say, uh, he's a little bit older than me. Uh, and he came from the posh village, which was next door. We just came from the normal, everyday working-class village. And so when was the age when you decided you was going to uh, get into racing? I always wanted to be into racing. I always loved horses. Well, I always loved animals. And uh, I used to ride out of my uncle's from about, on my school holidays from the age of about 14. And then there was a guy called Clifford Rawlings who worked for Fred Rymel in Worcester. In, in, sorry, up to on seven, or Kinnersley, as it should be properly called. And sometimes I'd go and stay with Clifford and ride out at Mr Rymel's for during my school holidays as well. How old was you then, Pete? Probably 13, 14. <laughs> I used to have a bike and I used to cycle there and back. I was a lot fitter then than I was now. <laughs> it, was about, it was about 18 miles. Really? Yeah, but I loved it, so I'd yeah. cycle. Yeah. And then, uh, but I think my uncle was told to put me off because he used to get my head, put it in the water bucket every day. He'd roll it the hell out of me. And I know I'd done nothing wrong, but I, it didn't work. In them days, it's, I mean, I was in the building industry and they used to put me in the cement mixer. And, oh, I didn't. And nowadays, you wouldn't get away with oh, that stop. today. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I used to be I was used to be hung up uh, when I was at Fred Ryan was because they're all bigger lads than me then I was only sort of sixteen weighed about nine stone and they used to hang me in the hay net naked and <laughs> just leave me there for the afternoon and I remember one one Christmas Eve they thought it'd be great to go and get me out of bed which they did uh, after they'd all been out and they tied me to the lamppost naked outside the yard and this was about. They'd been out a long time, so they, this was about half six in the morning. And uh, at half seven, Mercy Rymel drove past me into the yard, then walked to look, walked, looked, looked up and down and went, huh, what a shame. Then walked <laughs> off and left me. <laughs> because it, it was pretty small at that time after being an hour in the snow. <laughs> in the snow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I got, to, oh, I got well and truly abused. Yeah, so that, like, it's the old days of when things used to happen like that. Yeah, they did. So, that was good fun. Taught you, uh, yeah. toughened you up. Definitely toughened you up. Yeah. So what about, you actually rode and... Yeah, a few rising point to points and that, yeah. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't anything special or anything like that. 
Uh, the best thing I could do for riding was to retire. <laughs> it was safer for everyone else and the horses. Uh, but I, could, I, I, I enjoyed riding. And I, I, oh, until a few years ago, I did used to ride out. Well, probably 10, 15 years ago. But now my bottle's totally gone. You wouldn't get me on a horse now. Yeah, but it's a high up. Mm. Uh, so where did you go from? What, what actually started your career? I mean, I've heard lots of good stories and... Some bad. No, lots yeah. of good ones. More good ones. No, I... Uh, as I say, I worked for... Uh, Fred Rymel, who was at, at Kinnersley, which was a great yard, and we used to just, we only ever rode out two lots, sometimes we did three, um, we had some very good horses like Grand National winners, sort of, I was just before rag trade, but then Royal Frolic and other horses like that. These were all jump horses, All yeah. jump horses, yeah, because yeah. I was from a jump background, really. Right. And then I, I could see at the time that there was more money in flat racing, not that I'm greedy. And there was a job advertising the sport in life on the Saturday for a pupil assistant at Barry Hills. So I applied, and somehow I got it. I don't know how, but I did. The famous Barry Hills. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, Julia, I went there for my interview, and Barry was on holiday in Barbados uh, in January, and Julia Hall, his secretary, employed me. And Julia still works for me now. So oh, wow. she employed me, and she's still keeping an eye on me now, still 40 <laughs> years later. <laughs> that must have been jumping into the frying pan, out the frying oh, pan into the fire. Fred's was a nice, lovely, easy-going, friendly yard. And I went to Hills, isn't... I learned how to swear, anyhow, to start with. He was a very hard taskmaster, was he, Barry? Oh, yeah, no, he was. He was, yeah, but I just used to laugh, man. Yeah. The t- things he said to me, like, it was just... things, And also other lads. He used to have his favourite lads that were like his floggings, flogging lads, that he'd just, he'd just go down the string and they could have done nothing wrong, but just give yeah. him a bollocking for no reason whatsoever. But. Yeah. I've actually had horses with Barry and some experience, so like proper, proper oh, God, old I school. I loved it there, yeah. man. I really did. I was there as a pupil, which is basically just a dog's body. Uh, you do everything behind the head lad and everything for the head lad. And Snowy, Snowy out was head lad. And I did everything for Snowy. And I mean everything. <laughs> uh, but I love Snowball. He was a great guy. So where did you, what was the next step from there? Well, I worked there, just, I was just a pupil there all, all the time, really. And I got lucky. I looked after a very good horse called Gildor, and who won two Ascot Gold Cups. And then I was sent to the Isle of Man by Barry, by Barry in the winter to, to, to help Linda and Jack Ramsden set up training which was quite random. On the Isle of Man? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, and we had horses there. And, of course, Linda then came back and trained in Yorkshire. And she did a lot better when, without me. Uh, <laughs> but I was just there to help us help, help them get going. And we had a few runners and a few winners. I was there for six months, but that, that was good fun. That was good fun there. That would be an experience on the it Isle of Man, It certainly was, because yeah. I basically built everything, like the jumping lane, knocked down... Uh, walls and things like that so we could canter through fields uh, but no that was good and then I'd obviously I'd been at Barry's for oh god maybe five or six years five years and I, th- I was starting to get sort of itchy feet because John Hills was assistant there was no chance I didn't think of moving up yeah uh, and there was me and Joe Norton uh, who, who shared a house together and Joe and I were best friends who then went on to train Heaver Golf Rose, who won the Abbey, and we decided that we were going to go to America, and why and what we were going to do in America, I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> so we just let's go to America. So I said, yeah, it's a good idea. So we let we handed our notice in, left, and then we actually got. I got a job at Charlie Whittingham, and he got a job for someone else. So about a month before we were going to go, I read the. I was reading the Sport in Life. It maybe the Racing Post then, and it said that Barry had, was moving into Manton. So I thought, oh, well, never mind. Move on, this and that. Then my parents got a telephone call, got in touch with me, because at the time I was just being at Larrakin. I was up to everything. I was just having Enjoying fun. Enjoying life. I was, yeah. Uh, and got, got me a message to say, I think I was travelling around a bit of Europe at the time, uh, got me a message to say that Mr Hills wants to see you. So I came home, borrowed my sister's car and drove down to Lambourne. I met him there, and he said, you, I want you to start back here January the 1st. I want you to run the bottom yard. I need you. And I went, your pardon? He said, what? <laughs> and he said, you heard what I said. I need you. Now get back. 
and get your hair cut. I was going to say get your fucking hair cut, but I don't know what I'm allowed to say that on here. <laughs> say it, yeah, yeah no, it's get your it fucking hair cut. Because I said I'd been travelling, I was, I was just like feral, like I thought I was like surf boy. I had hair down here. I had sort of half a beard, and in theory, I should have probably had a shave and gone and got my hair cut before I went there. And his last words were, like, "Yeah, get your fucking hair cut." But Barry wouldn't be a bad judge, mate. So no, he, no, he, he must, got me back. He got Joe back. He must have seen something in you. To... And then he put me down the Barton Yard. Uh, which was the furthest part away from the main yard. And uh, I was assistant there. Three, four years. And we had some decent horses down there. And he just, he organised, I organised everything down there, but then re relayed it to him. So we did, uh, he obviously trained them, but yeah. he actually listened. How many horses was there in the bottom yard? There'd have been 40 odd horses. Right. Which was perfect. Yeah. And then we had some good horses down there, Scenic, Sir Harry Lewis. Nomadic Way, Glacial Storm. They were all, all yeah, good horses. Good horses. And we had plenty yeah. of others that were good too. Nice to be able to go to war with. On Further Flight, he was there. I remember Further Flight. He was very skinny and there was never much weight on him. And he didn't need much work. And it was just before the Ebor. And we'd all backed him at like 33 to 1. And by now he was about 3 to 1 favourite. And uh, Baz called me on the phone and said, that further flight, uh, I'm away tomorrow, but I think you should give him a bit of work, this and that, get so and so, get Pat on him, because Pat looked after him, and Pat weighed about six and a half stone. And I went, yeah, leave it to me, Governor, no problems whatsoever. So I put the phone over, oh, yeah, right. Uh, so I went and looked at the horse, and I thought, he doesn't need to work. So I said, tell you what we'll do, we'll give him a canter, we'll turn him out in the paddock. And we had paddocks down there. So I turned him out in the paddock. So right now, the, this is two days before the Ebor, so the, the next, the, the now, sorry, three days before the Ebor. So now we're two days before the Ebor, and I'm riding out, and we get to the top as we're walking down to the farmyard where the all weather is, and to the right is the barn yard. And the, I can see the, I can see further flight in the paddock as I'm walking down the hill. I'm thinking, God, and all of a sudden he, put, he never did it. He pulled up in the car, right, and he went down the window, and he goes, "That's that horse work yesterday." I went, "Yeah, yeah, all good, all good, no problems whatsoever." Then he started driving down towards the farmyard. I'm thinking, he's going down to the yard. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, and then I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just taking my feet out of the yard. I said, I think, I'm, I think, it's, I think he's going to sack me for the 25th time. And I said, I think actually he might mean this one. Right, so then he turned back around, came back up, wound his window down. And he goes, if it gets beat, it's on your fucking head. <laughs> <laughs> and then drove off. Yeah. So he'd obviously seen him out in the paddock. And then when he won, when he won, uh, we were... <laughs> We didn't, we obviously didn't have mobile phones then and everything like that in those days. And um, I think he, he stopped and he had Martin, his driver, called up the yard office. And I was out looking around and doing something. He spoke to one of the lads there. And the lad comes in and goes, the old man's been on the phone and said, he's, go to the odd fellows, get a few pints and he'll see us there. And I'm going, what? So I thought, all right. So we finished work. And I said, no, we've got to finish work, do it properly. Finished work, went down there. And then, all of a sudden, he pulls up with the odd fellas, and then we, off we went. And then we went back to the club at, the, at Manton, because we, we had a pub at Manton. Right. Which used to get a bit of a kick in, in the days. But working with Barry was an experience, and yeah. it, it was great fun, man. Just, just we had in, yeah. very good staff. And you knew if you did something wrong, you were just an idiot. And nine times out of ten, we all do things wrong. And you deserve what you got. Not always, but sometimes you <laughs> did. But when it came to anything like, you know, if an owner was generous or anything like that, Barrington was, you always knew that uh, yeah. you'd be looked after. And yeah. yeah. He was. How long was you there for, Pete? All in all, about eight, nine years. Was you? It, was, it was the best time of my life, really. Yeah. I loved it, man. So what made you decide to move on? Well, I'd been, during the winter... I'd been taking time off and going to Australia and doing a bit, little bits in Australia. And I could see the way they trained and the way we trained here. And I thought, I'm not that thick. If I can work it out, mix the two together, it, it could work. And then, like, obviously people know uh, Robert and Barry had a bit of a falling out. I think, I'm not 100% sure. And Robert decided to put the place up for sale. Robert Sangster, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think Barry nearly bought it because 
it, it didn't come up with it. Barry said, right, I'm moving out. I got a telephone call to go and see Robert, and he said, right, I want, I'm going to have 20 odd horses. You can stay on, be the like a care, I was called caretaker trainer. That's what he called me, caretaker trainer. <laughs> I said, till, I said, okay, till someone better comes along. I said, that's no problems. Yeah. Uh, so that that's how I got. That's how I started training, really. Right. Is that when you were, like straight away? What year was that? Nineteen ninety ninety or ninety one? Ninety one. Yeah. yeah. So that's really, and you had the, the it was in your name. Yeah, right, from Peter then. Chapel, yeah, I'm, yeah, from then. Because you were successful very quick. Yeah. No, because uh, obviously with Robert's horses, they were so well bred. If you just click right with them. They were good, very good. Yeah. And obviously I had Rodrigo de Triano and Dr. Davis in my first year. Yeah, yeah. Which was found unbelievable, really. And then the horses just kept coming after that. What about the uh, story with uh, John Reed when he um, got on Dr. Devious? What about the hairy goat? <laughs> well, yeah, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. The story that I got was um, um, he got, got on this big hairy thing and Pete said that he'd win the derby. Yeah. Uh, and he laughed, and it turned out to be Dr. Devious. No, it, was, it wasn't John Reed, actually. Oh, was it not? No, no, it was, uh, it was, it was Frankie. Oh, was it? Yeah. So Frankie got on Dr. Devious. Yeah, he rode him his first time he ran, and Frankie was a five-pound claimer then. Was he? Yeah. And uh, I, I was at Southall, because I had two runners at Southall, and he ran there, and I spoke to Frankie afterwards, and I said, what do you think? He goes, just a big hairy goat. <laughs> I said, yeah, but he won. Yeah, just a big hairy goat. I went, this also win the derby one day, you know. I said, I, I think he could be a derby horse because he'll stay. I, there was only six furlongs. But I said, I'm going to run him in the Coventry. And he goes, do you think you're going to win a derby by running in the Coventry? And I said, well, Generous did it the year, bef yeah, the year before. He was second in the Coventry. I said, so well, I'm going to do better, win the Coventry and the derby. So Frankie just laughed at me. And then Frankie rode everything for me the following year to start with and then came and saw me and said he'd been offered a job by a guy called uh, Sheikh Mohammed and I said who's yeah. he? <laughs> yeah I went me Sheikh Mohammed son I think you'd probably best go there yeah but I always still have him if he hadn't have gone he'd just been a derby winner before a long while before authorised I had to come and rescue him yeah but uh, yeah no uh, yeah because Frankie was Frankie was riding them all early on in the season because the year before we'd had Willie Carson and Paul Edry and then Paul Edry was gone to more with Jeff Lewis and Willie was a bit hamdan so I couldn't get those so Frankie had ridden Dr. Davis and a few others so he was riding everything early on in the season. Would you say um, Rodrigo de Triano was the best horse you've had? I, I don't like comparing friends and all that if you know what I mean but a couple of people yeah. asked me that question because it's the, the, it was their dream horse at the time. I loved him and he was just brilliant. He was brilliant. He just he answered every question he was ever given. Uh, he was, if he wasn't the best. Where did he come from, Pete? Did you buy him or? No, he was homebred. Oh, was he? He was homebred. And like people, because I was the caretaker trainer, people came to see these horses like Stouty, Michael, Luca, Henry Cecil, this and that, pick what horses they want. And they left these two. They left the two horses. Oh yeah, I remember that. Still. Yeah. And Rod Rodrigo, when he came in the yard, I promise you, you wouldn't. I wouldn't have picked him. He used to stand at the back of the box, shaking. And when he was out, anything that moved, he probably was gone everywhere. And it wasn't until one of the boys said, "Can we bring a radio in?" And I said, "Yeah, go on. I don't mind." And we'd never had radios when I worked for Hills. We weren't, we weren't allowed them. Uh, and they put the radio, and I noticed this all started getting his head out of the box. So then I moved the radio around outside his box. Also, this horse just chilled totally, totally out. So wherever, wherever he went, a radio went with him. Nice. And he'd have the radio, a little transistor radio, if he stayed overnight in his box all night. But he was a homebred uh, by El Grand Senor. And obviously, uh, his family, the, the mother's side, wasn't anything too special, but uh, he just was, was brilliant from day one. Yeah. And no, the lads that stayed with me instead of going with Hills, uh, with Barry, uh, Rory O'Dowd, and obviously his brother Barry, who's John Gosden's main man, and Rory's got a, I think he's with Archie Watson, that assistant at Archie Watson's now. They were good lads. Uh, he was on holiday, and after the horses arrived, everyone picked all their horses, and this horse was still left. No one had picked Rodrigo. 
Well, I said these are your two horses. Yeah. The three horses. You've got that one, that one, and that one. That was it. A proper story. No yeah. one had picked. No one picked him at all. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And what about authorized? Authorized. Yeah, I bought him. Yeah. Uh, was he expensive? Oh God, yeah. Was he? Yeah. Because the people I bought him for, obviously, was Salah Al Hamazi and Imad Al Sagar. They'd had a horse with me the year before. I think I told the story before that they'd bought back for a thousand pounds, and I'd won a couple of races with him, and he wasn't a bad little horse. And they said, oh, no, we're going to sell him, this and that. So they sold him. So I thought, well, we haven't got anything else to sell him to training. I thought, oh, OK, that's it then. That was a quick relationship. I would wish them all the best. So then I saw Tony Nurses, who then became their racing who was their racing manager at the races in Sala. And he said, we want you to pick out the best five horses in the sale. So I picked out a few. So I said, I like these. But the one I really like is this Monture horse. So then they came down and saw me. And uh, everyone, everyone else that said to me, oh, his hocks are far behind him, this and that. But I said, geez, hocks are like cocks. They all come <laughs> in shapes and sizes, but they all work. Yeah. You know? I said, I don't care about hocks. So I said, this is the horse I'd buy. He goes, OK, go to 600,000. So what went, year is this? Uh, three, two years before the derby. The year before, they had a horse that cost, they bought back for £1,000. Now, they're, spend, now they're going to spend 600. 600 grand. <laughs> so I went, okay, okay. <laughs> right. So I started bidding, and all of a sudden I got, I think, someone else is bidding, I'm thinking, they'll buy it. Right. So all of a sudden it got knocked down to me for 400 grand. So I'm looking for them, no sign of anyone. <laughs> so I signed me, they said, sign your name, Peter Chappell, I'm. So I walked out, I couldn't find Tony, I couldn't find Sala. I'm thinking, oh dear God. <laughs> What's happened? What's happened? So <laughs> someone said, you want a drink? I went, no, I think I'd better go home, because I don't think I can afford to have one here. <laughs> so I went home, got myself a beer, and I'm thinking, well, Pete, it was nice while it lasted. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this could be... All of a sudden, I got a call from Tony Nurses. I go, well done, Peter, we got a performance for 200 grand less. We've been, to, we've been to Tats and swapped it over into our account. I like, oh, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, this is going... But then, as hindsight, I could have been paying it off on dribs and drabs. Won the derby and earned a lot more. Yeah, that's... A, my, but he was, uh, he was then... I sent him off then to be broken in. And he went off to be broken in. Didn't come back till February time. But... You knew from day one he was just, he could go. Bit of class. Yeah. And then he went through, a, like most good horses or horses that are, are, are any, anything about them, they go through a weak phase. And he did that too, because he grew. And if they don't grow, they're no good. If they don't change, they're just no good. And during his weak period, he was absolutely useless. He couldn't get up Warren Hill. And the lad's going to be, oh, this horse is gone. This, see, he's just gone weak. Just relax. Yeah. Take, your time. take your time. Take your time. Then he started to come. Then he started to work. And uh, then I came out with another quote to Frankie. Uh, he ran at Newbury, and Eddie Ahern rode him. And I lost my temper a bit with Eddie. And I don't normally lose my temper. He gave me about five or six whelps. And I didn't like it. I said, you, I said, you hit my, one of my horses again. I told him not to hit the horse. I don't like the horses being hit first time out. Uh, if they're going to win, they can... A couple of slaps, yeah. yeah. But don't beat horses up. So... So, if Eddie had done that, he probably would have carried on riding. Uh, and then, uh, I was going to room at Leicester. And so, I worked him, and he worked fantastic, and I thought, Christ. And I worked him over race course side, and I had an old horse here called El Quasi. He was a, you know, he, he'd won about five or six handicaps on the bounce, and I think he'd just won a group three. Uh, seven furlong horse, so I thought, I'll work it with him, I will find out. So I saw Frankie, and I said to him, do you fancy coming in and having a sit on the horse? And uh, he goes, OK. So he comes in, sits on this horse, and it gallops, and he wing past. And as luck would have it, right, authorised, like most of his progeny, liked a little bit of cut. But every time I went to work him, we had a bit of rain, so there wasn't a problem. And he worked with a bit of cut, and now quasi all for like cutting the ground, and he wing past this horse. And Frankie just came back to me, he goes, hey, two year old? I went, yeah, he's a two-year-old, yeah. I said, I should stop doing the Italian accent, it's not working. A two-year-old, I went, yeah, yeah. He goes, what? I said, right, I told you before I'm going to win the derby. I'm going to win the derby again. He said, this time I believe you. Absolutely. And that was it. That's when I said, that's it. Let's go for the Racing Post trophy. He goes, you're mad. I went, I know. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you, have you ever sat down and worked out how many pattern races, big handicaps you've won? No, no. I can tell you. 
in the UK on in, in its own, about 150 plus. I, someone had told me that, yeah. That's in, like, I don't know how many people have got that sort of record, Pete. I was, I was told, Stouty told me. Right. Because I've, I've messed around with Stouty sometimes when he's sensible. Stouty told me that someone had told him that I was the third. There was, like, obviously Stouty, Mark Johnson. No, no, no. I was in front of Mark Johnson on, on, on stakes winners and that. Yeah. Yeah, I was third. Yeah. Yeah, it was incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, when did you th- the the um, move to Hong Kong? When did that come about? That was like obviously as a, a caretaker trainer. Obviously, John Goldston came around, so I was caretaker till John came. But no, uh, like uh, we were having. I think we my time had, had come with uh, with as Robert a, and I. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I wasn't happy because we'd sold Balanchine, we'd sold Cape Verde, we'd sold other fillies as well. And these were the fillies that were going to breed the horses for the so we were going to get good horses. Yeah. Uh, not that Balanchine did or Cape really did in the end, but only because they probably raced too long. Uh, and uh, everything, every time I produced a good horse, it just went. Uh, so I never had chance to, as a, to go on as a three-year-old, so they knew I wasn't happy. And I'd said to, I'd said to Robert at the start of the season, I'm, I'm seriously thinking about moving along. You must have been quite close to Robert, was you? Yeah, I was, yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah. he's a very yeah. famous man. and oh, he's a lo- lo- he was a lo- lovely man, Robert. Yeah. I'll tell you a story about him. I'm to see him, this and that, but... Uh, he's a lovely man, Robert, and so so kind. And when he used to pat his... That pat in his leg, you think, <laughs> well, what's going to happen now? <laughs> he just loved having fun, man. He loved Did having he? fun. Yeah. Uh, and they basically wanted Manton Phil full up. And I, I said, look, I like the way it is. I'd got my owners there. We'd got 100 horses, but they wanted more horses to make Manton pay more. Yeah. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't physically do it. And I didn't know the owners to do it, if you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. So that was the reason Mr. Gosden came in. Yeah. And John didn't, I say John didn't last there too long. But that then uh, I'd been offered a job in Hong Kong and I was going to go in June the next year because I was going to see out the season, take a bit of time off. <laughs> wasn't going to let my hair grow long again. <laughs> uh, and uh, how old was you this time, by this time, Pete? Going to Hong Kong. How old was you when you made that trip? Good question. To train in Hong Kong. I was probably in my late thirties, forties, forty years old. It was yeah. a big, big, big move. It was a big move. Yeah, it was a big move. But I'd seen. I'd, 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 I trained for Ivan Allen and David Hayes. I've known for years. They were talking me into going. Uh, and so I went in, I had a runner in the Ark, which is October, and I left at the end of October and went there. So I went halfway through the season. And it, it, it just didn't work out to start with. No. Uh, I'd, I had an assistant trainer that was training, who, who was Chinese, which is fine, because uh, they all were, who, who was training the horses before I got there. So he thought I took his job. He didn't ever speak to me. Uh, Not that you could talk back anyway. I didn't know what they were talking to me. <laughs> call me anything they want. Jackie Chan. I'd have gone, yeah, how do you do? Pleased to meet you. Uh-huh. Oh, I, I, I soon learned a few new words, don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can imagine. That's what he calling me, is it? <laughs> uh, and then I didn't have many horses to train. Uh, and to get owners over there, you have to train winners. And he basically got them all moved. Uh, so it was just, and I hadn't got a clue. I just got there, literally. You know, right, set up great. as a trainer for yourself, or...? Yeah, the setup itself is fantastic. Yeah. I just got there. I had a flat, which was furnished. Uh, the bed was like, oh, God, it was that hard. It was unbelievable. <laughs> it was like my blow-up bed I had years ago. <laughs> and that had a puncture in it. And uh, then uh, they paid... If you were an owner there, you had to be a member of the Hong Kong Jockey Club. They paid... You paid the training fees to them. We got a salary every month. Which, we, which wasn't a lot, but it was enough to live on. And <coughs> they paid, if you wanted to feed them gold dust, I'll feed my horses gold dust this week. That's what the feed would come in. They yeah. paid for all the feed, everything. So the setup was fantastic. But as I say, I got there. And they I, made you play golf a lot, didn't they? Yeah, yeah quite, I, I enjoyed that, yeah. I enjoyed <laughs> playing the golf bit. Uh-huh. Going out for lunch every day. New bridle, every, like all the, anything the horses needed. Anything the horses needed. Nothing too that. much. No, no. And as luck would have it, just before I came back here, 
my, my tack was getting very low. So I got 17 new saddles and 17 new bridles, 17 new sheets and 17 new rugs. And they all turned up here. It's funny that. No, not quite that way. But, uh, but no, everything. But as I say, I, I got there, on the, I think, on the Friday. And on the Wednesday, I had my first run at Happy Valley. I didn't know anything about the horse. I'd, I'd only seen it on Monday because that's the first time I was allowed in the yard. And two days later, I had my first runner. And I only managed to get there on time because I didn't know how to get into Happy Valley. I was driving round and round and round. And all of a sudden, <coughs> I just went down this place. I thought, oh, that's how we get in. It took me two and a half hours to get into Happy to Valley. To be fair, I'm lucky enough. I've been to both the Hong Kong tracks there. And it's some experience. Oh, it's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, to, to actually, well, the way we was looked after there, oh, I can imagine you. the way you'd have been looked after. Oh, yeah, we were, we were, we were looked after but in the end. But to start with, it was like, get on with it. Yeah. As I say, and for the first year and a half, I didn't like it much. I thought, what have I done? But then I started to think about how to train and started, you should knock it, come on. Uh, and the last two years, I really enjoyed it. I did enjoy it a lot. You were, so you were there for three and a half years? Three, four years. Yeah. Four years. But I told him I was only staying five. Right. Uh, oh, so you... I could have stayed longer if I wanted, but I thought, no. I've got yeah. made myself some money to yeah. set up training. Because I didn't have enough money to set up training, to be honest. Right. So then, you, so then you come back to the UK? Come back to the UK and ca came here, basically. Right. And I had no horses here. I just, I went and bought four yearlings. Uh, and I got a call off Robert. He had this horse called Harrison Point, would I like to train it, Robert Sangster. And so I had him, and I bought a horse at the sales called Toronto Heights. And at the time, Robert was ill with cancer. You know, he had uh, pancreatic cancer. And... Luckily, Harrison Point, I think, won his next, his first, I ran him three, his first three races, we, he won three times. And of course, Robert had a punt on him, he liked it. And as Guy Sankson said to me, every time that horse wins, it keeps him alive another month. <laughs> Thinking, oh, God, when's the next punt coming? When's the next bet coming? Uh, so, yeah, it, it was good that yeah. I, I, I was back with Robert again. Yeah, so, yeah. What, so since you've come back from the so, UK, what, you just kept getting more and more horses? Yeah, I did, yeah. And, of course, I know a lot of people come that I shouldn't have let come uh, who didn't pay, and you, you all know what that's like. Yeah. And then a few years ago, like, everyone knows a bit of the paper, I had, I still suffer now with uh, well, look, panic to be, attacks and anxiety and all that. To be fair, I think we was together nearly 10 years. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And all the time that I was here, absolutely loved it. Mm. Lo loved you as a, you're a true gentleman. Mm. Um, and everyone thinks so highly of you. But no one really realised that, Pete. Well, I kept it to myself all the yeah, time. Yeah, it's... It was so hard. Uh, and in the end, I just couldn't, I couldn't speak to anyone or do anything. I, I was think... just so physically wrecked. Yeah, yeah. No, no, mentally it, wrecked. To be fair, with all the things that was going on and that, it, it makes so much more sense now, but it was right, right. in front of us, but we didn't see it. Yeah, Cause, so I didn't you're, anyone know. You're, when, you, when, when you're there, you're full of life and energy, and you yeah. just wouldn't think... That's me. I, to, yeah. and I, think, I think as... Then my doctors did say to me, "That's that's the way you. I hide it. I pretend I'm fine. Yeah, all yeah. the time. I'm I'm just so and then away from other people. I'm not. I haven't spoken to you to, to you for a few years now. Mm. And then when I saw that in the racing post, I felt like I had to call you. And yeah, no, it was very kind. Thank yeah, you very much. And it just the, the amount of people that did. Yeah, that, no, that's uh, uh, they've had horses with me before, and a few of them, a few of them are coming back and like. Yeah, well, like we, I said to we, you, we, and we stamp it. We we know what you. We now know what was going on. Yeah. We couldn't at the time. Yeah. We always thought you were mad. We didn't think you were a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of describing yeah. it. But well, my, I mean, we were successful for a little syndicate. Oh, yeah, we had great we fun. We had some great yeah. fun, some great horses. Oh, yeah, it was a good fun laugh. Good, yeah. It was good fun. Yeah. That's what it should be about, fun. Yeah. You know, hey, every owner has to break even if we can. We've got to work it that way. Cause yeah. It's hard enough game for owners to, you know, to make money. And they can't just keep sponging money away. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you've got, to, but you've got to make it fun and have a laugh, and you know, hopefully, click. What can you? Did you? Did you ever use Lester Piggott? Yeah, well, he rode Rodrigo. He was his last. Oh, did ever, he? Rod, he he rode his last ever classic winner on Rodrigo de Triana. Can you give us an insight into Lester? <laughs> oh yeah, he's different. <laughs> 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 he was great fun actually. And he he's, he's a generous man. People don't say that, but he's a generous man with his time and his humour. He's very funny. But he doesn't, doesn't, unless you sort of know him, he doesn't, that side doesn't come out. Yeah. Oh, he's ruthless. 
if you had a good horse running, like if, if your filly was running Dubai Millennium, where it was running in the Oaks, and Lester thought it would, could win years ago, well, let's put it this way, Jack, poor old Jack wouldn't have been riding it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh... Lester would have been on the phone until you gave in. And he's riding it. <laughs> yeah, no, I went, I, unfortunately, I wasn't him racing him, but the name Lester Pickett's famous to everybody. Everyone knows Lester. Yeah. You just have to say his name, Lester. Yeah. He's, he's like, uh, in racing, you're like, you, you've got Frankie, everyone knows sort of Frankie's name, everyone knows Lester's name. But yeah. it's not just in racing, with Lester, it was more so out of, outside our little, our little bubble of racing. Yeah. In the whole world of sport, everyone knew who Lester was. But I'll tell you one story about Lester. We, uh, Rodrigo... He'd had a bit of time off, and I was getting ready for the Judmont at York, and he galloped at Manton, and it was the only time I let Lester ride him at home because I'd been told by Vincent O'Brien, don't let him near a horse at home, or any horses, because he'll just have feelers. He'll ruin everything. Uh, so I said, okay, okay. So I thought, I need to go out this horse. I'll get Lester in. Go on. So we galloped, and Dr. Devis was in the gallop, but Dr. Devis had been off ill for a long while, and he absolutely murdered him. Murdered them all. And he basically couldn't pull up Lester at the top. So he, pulled, he did pull up and he comes back and his first words to me, if you'd have had this red, this, this horse like this for the derby, I wouldn't have come off the bridle. I said, if you'd have put it in the race in the derby, I said, I'd have had first and second. <laughs> so then he goes, Rory, Rory, get on the horse. Because this is Rory. I said, no, no, Rory, you stay in the car. So we drove home, leaving Lester to walk the horse home so we could have the bet, get the price. Because at the time he was 16, 18 to 1. So I went to the office. I said, Rory, what do you want on? So we had it on. Robert was with us as well. So Robert called up his account, a turf accountant, and put, I won't tell you what Robert had on. He had a lot more than me and Rory did and all the lads. And then Lester was quite, he was, I suppose he, he, wasn't, he wasn't very happy about how the price had gone. So he said, I can only get eight to one now instead of 16, you greedy <laughs> bastards. So then the horse then, next time I see Lester, he's on, on Judmont Day at York. So I see him as I pull up, right? And I'd, have, I'd flown up, so I've got a taxi. So I've got the taxi, and I could see Lester. And Rodrigo, he was drawn, I can't remember how many runners there were. If there was 12 runners, he was drawn 12. If there's 15, he was drawn 15, way on the outside. And my plan was to drop him in anyhow. So Lester goes, yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> so, I'm like, oh. so I said, I know we're going to talk about the draw, don't you? And we're down the outside. What we should do, and before I could say anymore, he said, no, no, what you should fucking do is pay for my taxi, please. <laughs> and he just walked off. <laughs> so the taxi driver was looking at me, and I went, he goes, 20 quid, please. <laughs> so I went, so I gave him 20 quid, and he goes, I want 20 quid for the return journey. So I gave him 40 quid. So I said, yeah, again, he did me, he took 40 quid. <laughs> there and then. <laughs> and I, he just, well, what you need to do is pay for my taxi. No, he's more right. interested in that. Yeah, that's what, that's Lester though. But he just that is just a wind up, and that's what he does it for. Yeah, yeah. We used to fly back from going abroad, and on the little plane we'd go in, there'd be sandwiches and there'd be all sorts of stuff. We'd get there, we on the way back, we'd get home, and he'd be emptying the sandwiches and the rolls and everything into a plastic bag to take home. <laughs> I said, "What are you doing?" <laughs> he's going to my dinner. <laughs> I said, that, "That'll be stale by tomorrow." And he put it in the microwave; it comes up nice. <laughs> it was just something else, man. So, I mean, honestly, you sit and listen to these stories, Lester Piggott, um, Frankie Dittori, all these, you've, you, your oh, history is, yeah. your history is unbelievable, Pete. Everyone tries, everyone's trying to get me to write a book, and I, I think probably I will, um, and I will tell everything, I will probably get myself, I'll get myself in trouble here and there. But you won't, hey, because, who cares? Yeah, oh, okay. no, you've, you <coughs> but not, not with anyone, not, not nothing bad, I've never done anything bad in my no, life. No, I mean, I know you well <coughs> enough to know that you're a very, very good person. Yeah, um, but it, I'll give it to you, I, I have to admit, I think it, it could be quite entertaining. The, la the last things I really want to talk about, firstly, is where you think um, racing is going in the UK. With yeah. The, with, the, with, the, with the way it's run, how many different people are pulling in different directions, how much money's going in, just an insight into your thoughts on that. I mean, the BHA, and, I, and I'm, I'm honest all the way through, the BHA, the ROA, the RSA, all them, they mean nothing to me. It just seems they're doing absolutely nothing to help. At grassroots racing at our level, they're not helping us at all. No, we I, don't I, even get thought off, to be fair. I, I totally agree. Uh, and they'll probably set up another company as well, if you know what I mean, just to, just to make it look like they're doing something. Yeah. I don't think... Enough is not being done for, for, for owners in, 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 in racing. Whether it's the BHA, as I say, they... 
everything. They just don't seem to seem to understand uh, that we need we need more prize money. And they, all you've got to do is look at what happened the other day about they were taking 300 races off. Now they decided to put 300 races back on. Yeah. And the lady who's head of the BHA didn't even vote. And she abstained from voting. What's, who's, who's leading the ship? Well, she's gone it's, there, isn't she? And I think is, so, yeah. Is there yeah. a man involved? Yeah, but they didn't, didn't do... Uh, they d- but, I mean, you know, giving them it's people... Like, it's like we're on the Titanic. Yeah, giving p- them people wages of 430, pounds All you need to do... I don't need that. Get, when, I, when I first came into racing, the, we had the jockey club, and it was run by a bunch of old farts, a captain and colonel and my major, uh, but they all had horses in training, and they all were decent people. Yeah. And they ran it well. Yeah. And I always wished then that we had a younger bunch of people running to our take, racing yeah. to take it on. Yeah. Don't hope for what don't wish for what you hope for. Yeah. Because since that's happened, it's gone downhill. Yeah. We need the old boys back that, that knew about horses, yeah. know about people, work with people, and have done it all their lives. Yeah. But we need some new blood in there when someone should be at the top. Somebody who understands horse racing. Understands <laughs> who understands horse racing and who has horses in training. Yeah. Or has had horses in training. <coughs> who is interested in our business. Not yeah. worried about how many shillings, pence and pounds they yeah. can make the BHA themselves. Yeah, yeah. And haven't I done well? Haven't we done well? I uh, know, oh but the, the poor owner, he's just won two and a half thousand pounds in a race there, which cost him for a horse to have in training 15,000 pounds a year. Well, they tell me that, like, um, all of a sudden... Owners like uh, my little syndicate and other little syndicates and all the rest of it, you know, we sh- it should more or less pay for itself, but it you can't do. make it pay. You can't. It should pay for itself. So if someone is creaming off all the, uh, you know, like from what I can understand, the amount of money that goes in and the amount of money that actually ends up at prize money, something, it's not transparent at all. It's not at all. Not at all. Well, if you look at when we had lockdown, right, and they said, oh, we can't, we, uh, there's no betting going on, this and that. Then we found out that every race course was getting £15,000 to put a race on. Yeah. So wh- where does that go? Yeah, where is the money? Where is the money? Yeah. And they so we've got to help the race courses out, this and that. They've got half the, the, half the people on furlough. They're getting 15 grand a, 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 a race, six, uh, six races, seven races. <coughs> the prize money doesn't come anywhere near it. Like, I still can't believe. Um, and, you need and someone to look in, into it yeah. big time. Yeah, but no one does. No they, one does because everybody's protecting each other. They're all Everyone's after, taking. Yeah, it's an old boys' club. They're all looking after themselves. Yeah, I always say, and I've said it in interviews before. It's like the Masons. You just yeah. don't know what <laughs> you don't know what's going on in there. And I'm you sure really a few don't. of these are going to funny have a few funny handshakes. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. <coughs> yeah. But I mean, you had a, um, a firm come into you here. I say a firm. I don't understand them. Um, Phoenix Bloodstock. Yeah. I mean, to me. Um, and, I, and I met the fella a couple of times at the sales. Very amicable, very nice fella. Um, they got accused of all sorts. They was putting a lot of money into British racing. And as far as I'm aware, um, the, the BHA uh, banned them from racing in... The, I mean, you can correct me on this, but it seemed like they banned them in the UK. But they're allowed to run in Ireland. They're allowed to run in America where they had their problems. Um, and from what I can understand from some friends I've got in America, they're not even looking into him in America. No, because Amir, he is, he is a very nice fellow, very easy, easy going guy, Amir. He's, I know he's been in America uh, for, for some while, he's back now, and he basically had enough and went to see, went to see the FBI in New York, as far as I know. Uh, and they told him he was not a man of interest and let him come back to Dubai. That's so... Just... Uh, I don't know what it. As far as I could work out, it actually the BHA stopped him from having horses in training, but it was Weatherby's as well. They wanted to know where the money was coming from, and that's why it happened. But Who, what, <coughs> what business in this country would tell you where their money's coming? Exactly. I don't. I wouldn't I mean, tell them where my money came from. No. 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 The, 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 yeah. just, the thing that the the reason I'm hitting on that a little bit really is for me is because. I'm passionate about syndicates. Yeah. I think syndicates are the way to go in the UK. They are, um, to give, give, give people yeah. a chance. And then you get these micro syndicates where they're buying a horse for 1,500 quid, selling 200, 300, 400,000 pounds worth of shares. And it's not being... You can just do what you want. Well, that, that is an absolute joke. That needs looking into big time and stopping. Yeah, but they will stop Phoenix from... Because they're yeah, not... No, the, yeah, but, yeah, but they, because, won't, yeah. they won't stop They won't them. stop that, yeah. Well, Phoenix, at the end of the day... I always thought you were innocent until proven guilty. 
And it was I one, would say exactly the same. It was one man's word who was on was on was in, in a court of law in America, who has now been subpoenaed over that, and that has been taken out of what he said because he said it was a lie. Yeah. But nothing else has been done about it. Yeah, exactly. But and, you know, like whether we don't, I'm not, I'm not defending Phoenix. I'm not defending no, I, anybody. No, I know. Uh, what I'm saying is, why isn't this? Why can't somebody have this discussion that we're having? And because I have don't, an I don't, answer. I don't, I don't. I don't think they, they want to have it. I think they just like to. Do, they just wanted to drag on and on and on. It's like the BHA giving the ROA um, 1.2 million to do an assessment how to get people back into racing, and then when the ROA come up with nothing, yeah, absolutely nothing. They, in fact, they ask for more money. The BHA asked them, "Well, where's that money been spent?" And they wouldn't tell them. Yeah. I so, mean, what is going on in racing? I don't know. It's disgusting, honestly. It's absolutely some of it, some disgusting. Of it is totally disgusting. I totally yeah, agree. Yeah. I totally agree. The transparency is horrendous. But anyway, that's the that's for me. That's my passion in yeah uh, in horse racing, and I think it needs sorting out. Oh, it does need sorting out big time. We need to, we need to, you know, you know, need to get a get a guillotine. Yeah, sort yeah. a few things out. Well, it just seems like there's a horseman's group. There's a the, the Everyone's got their own group, probably 30 or 40 groups, but everyone's pulling... Oh, it is, yeah. There's more teams than there are in the Premiership. I don't know who they are. <laughs> no? more, more, more groups than came from Liverpool. <laughs> but, you know, they're just, every, time, every time I read something, I think... And it confuses me, and it's not hard for me to get confused now. <laughs> Who's he? What, what, what part of team is he in? What, what, oh, no, stop. But it's been fantastic coming here today and talking to you again. Since you've opened up to the, to the Racing Post with that interview... Um, I think things are going to really improve for you because I, I do suffer a little bit myself with mental health. Yeah. And when you get down, um, you think it's just you're getting down, but it can be quite deep. And yeah, lots of people, um, you know, and I, and I feel I know you quite well. Um, and I really, really hope this is going to give you a lift now. Yeah, I think I, talking I, about it helps, Pete, do you? Talking about it helps. And what has also helped as well... Uh, since I've, I've got myself slowly better, slightly better, because before I couldn't have done this. Yeah. If you look at me five years ago, I couldn't have done this. No, well, to be fair, when, be I, there. When, <laughs> I, when I asked you to do this, I said to the boys, if we could get Pete up onto there, it'd be lovely to talk to you again. It'd be lovely to get, get back together again. Um, but, but also I've been doing, I've been helping people out that have gone through this as well by talking to them. Yeah. Which I find... Better than me talking to someone than when I had it. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it takes a lot off my shoulders as well. Yeah, yeah. and uh, anything I can do to help anyone that is, is like that. Yeah, and I, I found that has helped me personally that's as a, well as helping them. That's a good point actually, because I yeah. did speak to somebody once about, about the same thing, and they started lecturing me. And I was it, lucky. I it nice sent me girl. the other way. To yeah, be I had fair. a lovely woman. Yeah, and she she took her time with me because. She did say to me, oh, you're in a bad way, boy. Because <laughs> I, I kept walking out the office and walking back in the office and out the office and in the office in her place. And she said, what are you, a yo-yo? I don't know what I am. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just, um, let's hope that it's going to go the right way. For yeah, of course it will. Of course it will. Yeah. Of course it will. But you've always, ever since I've known you, you've always had that attitude. Um, I really, 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 in my heart, yeah, hearts. Yeah, it's fun. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Pete, thanks very much. Thank you, Tony. Great, a pleasure. Great insight into... The Peter Chaffelheim that I've known for a long time and really admire. Um, and I said to you, I'm going to have a horse with you again. Do you remember the first time we met in a pub? Yeah. In the in boot. Dog, yeah, the boot. In the boot. And I said to you, one day I'm going to have a horse with you. Yeah, you did, yeah. And three weeks later, yeah. you had two. Two. That's right, the boot, yeah. God, I hardly ever go to the boot now. Do you I'm, not? Oh, yeah, we still, I still love going there. I go there with Cock, me, Cocky, Vaughan, Mark McStay, <laughs> and then Ed Pete. We go for lunch. We go for a, a quiet lunch. Ended up in the boot. We couldn't. We used to be doing joined up talking. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> Pete, that's absolutely fantastic. I've really enjoyed it today. So, thank you very much. Cheers, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant.